Hello everyone, this is the book that I'm reading at the moment called River Keep. I thought I'd share the blurb with you and then the opening chapter. Wool knew it was his papa as he had always known him, but there was something else there now too. Fifteen-year-old William is dreading taking up his family's mantle of river keep, tending the river and fishing corpses from its treacherous waters, but then everything changes. One night his father is possessed by a dark spirit, and Wool hears that a cure lurks deep in the great sea beast known as the Mormorak. He realises he must go on an epic journey downriver to find it or lose Papa forever. So, Chapter One Your hands are shaking, William. Wool shrugged and shifted his grip on the mug. It's cold. Papa laughed, releasing a stinging breeze of liquorous tobacco. That's no cold. Cold is where your eyeballs scratch when you blink and when it hurts to breathe. You'll be river keep soon. You'll get used to that quick enough. I'm no river keep yet, said Wool. Never, he thought. Papa secured a knot and sat back on his haunches. But a week will be no long passing, my boy, he said. Time feels long for the young, but don't worry, you'll be no be young for long. He grinned and went to get the boat ready, ruffling Wool's hair as he passed. The deep creak of his rubber boots faded into the gloom beyond the lamp. Wool put down the mug and looked at his hands, already thickly scarred with the burns of rope and snow. Over the voice of the river, sucking knocks and shifting wood, he felt the needles of sound as the new ice along the banks of the Danic cracked. Ice meant winter and darkness, and for water folk a new kind of danger. Papa saw it as a great enemy to be feared and defeated with flames and rods, but it brought wool respite from the river's black void, its thick scum and little puddles of treacherous clarity, and the huge, sharp rocks fringed with weed that swirled like a corpse's hair. In the heat of summer, perfumed wildflowers grew along the banks. Insects skittered on the leaf-padded surface and silvery clouds of fish burst through the water, chased by the Sulas, whose wet little heads dotted the surface like stepping stones, their golden summer eyes glowing in the sunlight. But Wool could never think of the river as something living. He had seen what had happened on the rocks. The floating bodies, arms raised and mouths howling against the surface as though restrained by thick glass. It was the river keep's job to push his arms through that barrier to embrace the dead, to lower his face close to theirs and taste the bilge stink of their breath before lifting them from the water. Papa did so with a martyr's grace, blind to gangland markings and forgiving of sinners who took their own lives. Wool had watched them since he could remember, propped in a grotesque parody of sleep, as though they were snatching a nap in the back of the little barter. Now he sat with them. Sometimes the bodies were old and the flesh slid from their shining bones like the skin of a poached fish. Wool did not want this wilderness life. With Papa's help, he had read the ledgers in their entirety, right through to the ninth volume in Papa's own careful hand. The ledgers didn't just list the dates, they told the stories, detailed bodies' decomposition and kept the words of the rescued and their reasons for jumping. Sweethearts, fear, sicknesses of the mind and often, so often, coin. At first, Wool had taken this literally, as though they were jumping into a wishing fountain to fish for pennies. Then he had realised and felt like a foolish child. Every entry was the same. To Papa, this was priceless, a means of creating something that would stand forever as a monument of pride and respectability. To Wool, it was a prison of words, repetitive, rotting words. He reached over and touched the ledger that sat open on the desk. Their last discovery had been just over a week ago. 3101, a widow, face up and floating on rot-swollen breasts, her cheek cut with a debtor's mark. But, as always, the most recent entry was the next number, 3102, offered with the prayer of the river keep, that the number might never be filled. He closed the ledger. The mould-edged pages heavy with moisture, fell with a report that bounced round the boathouse like the slamming of an enormous door. Wool heard the creak of Papa's boots in the darkness. You're coming tonight? Will shook his head. It's too cold. Aye, you've told ye. That's... I know. It's just... Not tonight, Papa, please. 
Papa regarded him a moment, shifting the wad of liquorice leaf around in his mouth. Then he shook his head. You're nearly 16, was all he said. The air was sharp and hard in Wall's lungs. Even wrapped in layers of Zula gut, he felt the chill of the exposed flesh inside his boots and round his waist like the cut of wire. The white, still world communicated itself through his frozen eyelids as a sharp whine outside of his hearing, and he stamped his feet on the barter's exposed ribs and buried his face in his elk fur collar, peeping over when his eyes could stand the cold. The lanterns, staked in the riverbed where the currents met and the flotsam gathered in eddied clumps, made glowing islands in the velvety darkness. Their flames fuzzed in the ha like dandelions. The industrial mic of, might of a rocco was silent. The howls of its foundries and smithies carried away on the east wind. The only sound in the smothered world was the rhythmic clicking of the oars and the soft noise of the blades moving through the water. By the fifth lantern, they had discovered a grey gull, torn open by a sula. Not much else left for them, Papa said, and the broken spokes of a carriage wheel. The gull was flapping limply, trying to fly on shattered wings while it bled onto the ice. Papa reached down and gently snapped its neck between his thumb and forefinger. Wool watched him ease the body into the water on scar-twisted palms. As far out as the edge, at Lantern 22, they still had found nothing more than knots of weed and grass clinging to the ice rods. Wool peered into the unseen and untended wilderness beyond the last outpost of the keep's realm in the depths of which lurked the bustle of Oroko's cooked docks, the flashing steel of bandits, and, past a scattering of hamlets, the Danex estuary and the wider sea. He trailed his glove tips in the water and flicked droplets out towards the beyond. Papa saw him, tutted, then, as he turned the barter towards the boathouse and its warmth, they found 3102. It was male, Fat-backed and face down, white flesh streaked with a pattern of cuts and bruises, wool new came from the fierce, swirling currents near the footbridge where Mama had drowned. It had been wearing a uniform that still clung to it in scraps, and there were murky tattoos spilled along its visible skin. Pieces of its scalp were missing, and leaks of blood and fluid coloured the wafer of snow-dusted ice that had crept round it. Papa looked at wool. The footbridge, said wool. Papa nodded solemnly. The flames cut his face into slices of light and dark, one eye hidden in the black wedge behind his nose. May Laverne's keep thee, he muttered, lifting the oars from the water. Here, William, row. Wool took the oars, turned the barter and heaved it forward. Even now its great weight pulled at him as though it might shatter his wrists. He looked down at the floating form of 3102. It looked bunched, not loose, and sat tightly in the water. The ice must be holding it steady, he thought, dropping the oars and stilling the barter. He stood as Papa stood. The painted eyes on the barter's pro faced stoically forward. Half shut and focused, they peered into a darkness that, beyond the reach of the lantern, was absolute. Wool turned from them to the reassurance of the flames. Without the movement of the boat, the silence was so empty he felt the weight shift in his stomach and the hair creep on his back. Papa, he said. Shh, Willem, a minute. Papa tipped back his hat and muttered the river keep's prayer. Then broad back, bra braced and legs wide, he reached down to hug the wretched lump into their boat. 3102 hugged back. In a flurry of movement that lasted no more than a gasp, the two figures disappeared beneath the surface and Wool stood rigid, his breath billowing and his skin tight. In the instant his papa had vanished, he'd seen a brown mouth opened wide like a snake and two eyes that glittered like razors. The eyes had met Wool's. The water was still. There weren't even bubbles. Fighting the sudden lightness in his skull and with a kick of painful nausea taking his wind, Wool began to sweat, feeling panic speed his heart. He stood still for a timeless age, unable to move, listening to the silence and staring at the space in the water through which Papa had vanished, trying to force his lips to form Papa's name and sending only the tiniest wisps of breath into the freezing air. It was the cold that brought him back to himself, needling wakefulness into his muscles. For the first time in his life he was aware of the thinness of the planks that separated him from the black void beneath and he felt the emptiness of the world like a fist in his gut. 
felt the distance of other people as he never had before. Wool heaved the oars into place and sat in the keep's chair, tears freezing on his cheeks, his gaze locked on the spot where Papa had vanished. Papa had shown him how to row, then made him practice until his knuckles bled, but his return journey took an age. He was weakened by terror and blind to his destination, branches scraping the prow behind him. A sula bro broke the water beside the boat, its golden summer eyes now a piercing winter's blue, and wool dropped the oars in fright. The grabbing shadows of the banks reached across the white water and beneath him the river moved unusually, each swell and press of a current renewing the feeling of his razor eyes slicing into his, and he prepared himself for the water to rise up and take him. 3102 was waiting for him on the sand. Face up, the sight was no better. The skin was fish-picked and rotten, the guts torn by an adventurous Sula so that its stomach hung open like a bag of wet coal. Its uniform was that of a sea wearer, and a broken musket still hung from its belt. It wasn't moving and seemed to be quite dead. With a huge burst of courage, Wool threw a stone at it. The pebble bounced harmlessly off the hollow body as though it was nothing more than a sponge. Fearing to expose himself to the thing unguarded, he backed into the boathouse and closed the door. By the time he reached the window, it was gone. Wool stood at the window for as long as he could before releasing his breath and clouding the glass. Then he went and made himself tea, focusing on the loose leaf in the water and the stove's flame to ground him, to bring him back to normality. In a world of tea and unreliable matches, there could not also exist corpses that moved. There could not exist an absence of papa, as there could not be an absence of sky or air or water. He pictured Papa, thought his voice. Ledger, Papa would say, it's the soul of the river keep, of us. Wool drew the book to him and lifted the enormous cover. As it fell open, he thought of the movements that might be hidden by that sound and he glanced around him, into the corners left by the flickering lamps. The body of a man found by Lantern 22. He wrote carefully, elbow pointed. Swollen and white, having been tampered with by the rocks and fish and Asula, stomach open and black. He paused, unable to return body, gone. Will lifted his tea, then lowered the mug without drinking. He raised the pen again and wrote the next number, 3103, then sat back, tears creeping onto his face. It felt that his blood, rather than the ink, had stained the parchment. May this number be never filled, he whispered, eyes closed in prayer. The timbers of the jetty creaked steadily and the sound grew larger until the footsteps reached the sand and ceased. May the waters spare whomsoever crosses their path from here unto eternity. There came a new sound of creaking rubber boots. They reached the door of the boathouse and Wool could sense the angry weight on the other side. A thickness of a plank away, and he knew it was his papa as he had always known him, heavy with lacoris and slow of movement, but there was something else there now too. Wool began to sob, forcing his eyes to remain closed. The handle turned. And bless the river keep on his journeys, said Wool, fighting his fear as the smell of the river filled the air and the weight of the thing moved towards him as he endeavours to keep thy waters safe from causing harm or from being themselves a harmed. The movement behind him stopped. Amen, said Wool. So that was the first chapter of River Cape, and I just thought you'd also like to know that I have in fact met the author of River Cape. I don't know if you can see that. I've got it signed for me as well. So enjoy listening to that. I look forward to hearing what you guys are all reading as well.